The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, and welcome to today's webinar titled International 101, How to Succeed in the Global Aviation Market. I am Matt Griffin, the Director of Regulatory Affairs and Education at the Airport Consultants Council, and it is my pleasure to be the host of the webinar today. This is the second webinar to be sponsored by the ACC Young Professional Forums, and we have well over 100 sites registered for the event. This is one of many initiatives that have been undertaken by the ACCYP Forum, and we'll have more information on the forum and its activities in a moment. For those of you not familiar with ACC, we are the International Trade Association that represents private businesses that help plan, design, operate, and supply airports across the country and around the world. ACC is the only association that represents private sector businesses involved in airport development, and part of our mission is to help promote beneficial procurement and contracting practices that enhance opportunities for companies like yours to compete in the marketplace. We also provide opportunities for members to receive technical training on a number of varying topics related to airport development, network and develop professional relationships with peers and airport clients, and interface with decision makers at the FAA, TSA, and other federal agencies on regulatory guidance and AC updates. I'm now going to open up a poll uh, to ask each one of you to let us know how many folks are participating at each of your site. Um, please select one of the five options here regarding how people are watching, how many people are watching at your site. While you're doing that, before we get underway, I have a couple of important logistical notes about the webinar. First, participants on the call will be muted. We encourage you to ask questions using the questions window on the right-hand side of your screen. I will collect the questions and relay them to the webinar speakers at the end of the presentation. Also note, we will send you a copy of the presentation and a survey later today. Finally, as you are taking the poll, I want to remind you that you may notice a slight delay as I advance the slides. We appreciate your patience as we move through the presentation. All right, let me close the poll before we... I'm now pleased to introduce the leadership of the ACC Young Professionals Forum, uh, Zach Varwig and Carly Shannon. Real quick, uh, Zach is the Systems Analyst at Faith Group LLC, specializing in the planning and design of security, safety, operational, and information technology systems for aviation, transportation, and government facilities. He graduated in 2012 from the Miami University Farmer School of Business with a degree in finance. Carly Shannon is the Vice Chair and is Project Planner with CNS Companies. Her experience consists of airport master plans and airport layout plan updates, sustainable master and management plans, lead administration and staff training, and development of strategic waste management and recycling plans. Carly has a bachelor's degree from Boston College and is pursuing a master's from the University of Florida. You can see their full bios there on the slides. And with that, I will turn it over to Zach, who will provide a little more uh, overview of the ACCYP forum. Thanks, Matt. I'm going to jump slides. Yep. So uh, as a quick overview for the Young Professionals Forum, we really focus on three areas, uh, promoting education, leadership development, and developing networking opportunities. Um, following out from those, from an education promotion standpoint, you know, we sponsor webinars like this one. Uh, I'm very excited that we've had over 100 people sign up, or 100 sites, I should say, hopefully more people sign up for this webinar. Uh, we also sponsor events at many industry functions, and we um, overall give opportunities for young professionals in the aviation space to participate in conferences and speak on panels. I, I think from an education standpoint, uh, that's crucial for moving through the industry is you, know, you continue to build not only your company's brand, but your personal brand. Uh, we also develop leadership development opportunities um, through mentorship programs and also leadership within the Young Professionals Forum. And then finally, uh, from a networking standpoint, we do sponsor a annual innovation competition, which encourages ACC members to reach outside of their firm. Um, more information on the innovation competition after we're finished with the webinar. Uh, we also sponsor receptions at many different industry events, um, mostly sponsored by the ACC, so please keep your eye out for those opportunities and those events so you can network with your peers. Next slide, Matt. So jumping into the content for today, I, this webinar is based around feedback that we received from a poll we do 
a few polls annually of everybody in the ACC YP forum. Um, one of the things that fell out was the YP group, or I'm sorry, the YP forum wanted to have a webinar on how to succeed in the global aviation market. Um, the things that we polled and we found out of that, we, we wanted to focus on the pros and cons of working abroad and the skill sets required to succeed. Uh, understand what proper preparation and culture barriers that may arise in doing business overseas. Um, navigate the contracting and other legal complexities that arise from doing business internationally. And then finally, how to better market and sell to international clients. So those are our focus areas for today's webinar. And to start us off, we have Keith Thompson. Keith is the Aviation and Transportation Global Practice Area Leader for Gensler. And he's been a practicing professional in aviation, facility planning, and design since 1980. Uh, he has a lot of international project experience just in the last five years, having worked all over the globe from South Korea to Guam to New Zealand, Mexico, Singapore, China, and Taiwan. Notice none of those places are going to be especially cold, so Keith knows how to choose a good site. Um, and he graduated from MIT in 1980 and got his MBA from UCLA. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Keith. Yeah, and South Korea does get cold, by the way. Just in oh, but it's southern out. South Korea. Any part of South Korea can get cold. Um, yeah, good to meet you. I've, uh, not such a young professional anymore, but what certainly was back in the day. Next slide. And thought I'd share with you just some uh, some basic stuff about doing work internationally. I, I, a lot of what I think was alluded to in the topic has to do with marketing and contracting. And as a young professional, I'm not entirely convinced you'll be thrown into that mix yet, although there'll be some aspects of it that you'll certainly need to be familiar with. But I just I've kind of broken it up to getting there, being there, uh, and working there. Uh, some things that people seem to forget, and I've been surprised that people don't seem to have this. If you really want to work internationally, you need a passport. Uh, some people are surprised when you say, hey, we've got to do this. Oh, I don't have a passport. Well, it takes time to get it. But more importantly, you need to have six months remaining on it, uh, or many countries won't allow you to enter their, their country. So be sure you've got a passport. It's sort of the first step. Uh, visas, uh, some countries are easy to fly into. Others take some doing. Uh, the, the visa process can be very simple in a lot of countries. But in places like Brazil, I actually applied for a 10-year visa in Brazil. It took one month to get the visa. And at that period of time, or during that period of time, you actually have to turn over your, your passport to them, and you don't get it back for a month. So I think it has when it comes to visas as well. Travel, you know, since uh, young professionals are not always the ones that get the upgrade to business class or first class, uh, I'd say, you know, pick your airline. Uh, a lot of airlines have 31-inch pitch. Some have 32. If you're doing a 10-hour to 14-hour trip, that seat is everything. And you'll want to get on and use seat guru or something like that to find a seat that's at least reasonable given you may be flying coach. Uh, there's a premium economy, which is a relatively new and, and not always discovered service level that's kind of halfway between business and coach. I recommend it highly as a cost competitive alternative to business class. Uh, if you're picking your hotel and it's not done by somebody uh, around you, uh, aside from doing some of the searches on on uh, TripAdvisor or things like that, check Google Earth Street View if you have a choice in where your hotel is to see what the street around it is like. You could find yourself in the middle of a red light district without you knowing it, or if you want to be in a, a lively, trendy area or a quiet neighborhood area, you can make those kinds of decisions better that way. Currency, when you get to where you're going, People typically look for exchange desks, but frankly, ATMs are about as easy and, and more straightforward than than, uh, than exchange desks. Keep in mind, you're probably going to be charged a service charge, so when you submit your expense report, don't forget that what you've got on your on your credit card slip may not be all you pay. You may need to look at your credit card receipts and file a subsequent uh, subsequent one. I always keep, I just was looking at today, I've got about 15 different currencies with me most of the time. I never turn it all back in and try and reconvert it because you never know when you're going to need it again. Plus, it makes for actually interesting conversations when you pull it out at a bar somewhere. Uh, emergencies. Uh, we had a guy that was stuck at uh, Narita during the Fukushima reaction. He was there for three days living in the off space of the airport. So you want to make sure you people have known where you are and how they can get in touch with you. So that in an emergency situation, you've got some recourse. Uh, and then language, uh, 
I, I use LingoPal on my iPhone. It's kind of an interesting app for getting around hotels and restaurants and so forth. But clearly, if you have a language skill, and that will come up later, having a language skill in the country you're going to is really, really, really useful, even if it's rudimentary. Next. Next slide. Yep, go ahead. Uh, we have uh, a, uh, when you're there, one of the things that helps is we have something called Flightback. It's a uh, subscription service that uh, gives us a quick synopsis of all the countries that we might find ourselves working in. And I mention this because a lot of times you go there and it's, it's more than just tipping. It's uh, gift giving, it's dress code, it's business etiquette. And this flight pack, if you should find yourself available to, to get it, gives you a very good synopsis on a country-by-country -country basis of what the basics are of working in that country without stepping on your toes. Uh, this is pretty hard to read, but uh, you know, there's a larger one that uh, Zach could probably make, make available that you could see the level of information. And again, this is kind of a subscription service, but it's really useful in giving you sort of some basics of how to, how to navigate the ins and outs of the country. Next. Done. Uh, working, working there. Uh, anybody that's working internationally needs to at least be aware of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Uh, this is a uh, act that came about as a result of I think Taiwan or Lockheed working in Taiwan in the 70s. But it's an individual. Uh, you're basically liable on an individual level, not a company level, for criminal activity having to do with essentially bribery of foreign officials to win and, and procure and, and do work. You need to, and I'm not going to pretend to be the expert in it, but you need to talk with your uh, risk management or corporate compliance people and make sure that you understand what FCPA is before you start working internationally so you don't find yourself inadvertently getting swept into a uh, uh, difficult situation. Likewise, I'd say cultivate a strong liver. You know, a lot of places you go, there's a lot of drinking. And uh, particularly in Asia, you may find yourself taken out to clubs until the wee hours of the night. If you're not a drinker, you know, Find a way to get around it, but uh, don't be surprised if you're exposed to a lot of a lot of alcohol when you when you travel around the world. And then finally, there's the you know the visa requirements, type, licensing, tax, currency issues, and all those things affect your ability to work internationally. Now, as a young professional, you're probably not setting up the deal and don't have to wrangle the stuff in the in the front end, but you have to be aware that it exists. And a lot of what you're doing and may not be able to do may center around uh, some of these various requirements. For example, as a U.S. professional, you may not be able to uh, be the architect of record or engineer of record on a project in China or in other countries because they expect their own locally licensed people to be able to execute that portion of the work. Likewise, in places like Brazil, actually even in Mexico, you know the, the tax laws are such that if you are a foreign worker working in that country, you're taxed at one rate. If you're a foreign worker working back in the States on work for that country, it's at a different rate. If you're another foreign national working in Mexico or outside of Mexico on projects in there, there's all kinds of different tax rates. If you're putting together a team and budgeting a project, you need to be familiar with all those. We have a, a risk management group at Gensler that uh, when you start an international project, we submit what's called an IPLOP, which has an abbreviation for something I can't possibly remember right now. Uh, but it basically gives us all sort of the the ins and outs of what we understand about licensing, tax, currency, and visa requirements for working in a given country. And, you know, there are work rules. You can work for six months or you can work for a week uh, without having a special, a special visa. But if you do need a special visa, it takes time, it takes energy, and you need to budget and plan for that accordingly. In places like Canada, for example, uh, in a classic example, if you go up to Canada and say, oh, I'm going to work, they'll stop you at the border. If you're just coming up for a conference or a meeting, that's okay. So you, you got to be kind of cautious about that. Check out the requirements of the country you're, you're working for and with, and that should be fine. Next. Yeah. Uh, and then some of these things, that, as a young professional, how do you make yourself valuable for international work? You know, I think personally, and these are, these are not just for international work. It's kind of for anything. Writing skills, uh, you know, frankly, writing skills are the great you know, oft-recognized benefit or unrecognized skill that, that professionals need to have to communicate effectively. Certainly, if you're working internationally, the language barrier is tough enough. If you, if you can't even write effectively, it's not going to help you. Uh, mobility, you've got to go to the work. Don't expect it to come to you. Uh, I think there's a lot of 
at least in some cases, you know, I'll we'll do the project back at home and I'll show up every two weeks and, and deliver it to you. That, that may not be your option. Uh, flexibility, make yourself a strong generalist with a specialty so that if your specialty isn't needed at a given point in time, you can still be effective and part of a team. Uh, language skills, clearly on a global project, if you have a language skill in the country that you're, you're looking at, that is going to place you in a very privileged position relative to others in the firm. Uh, what we call EQ, can you moderate your message to match the situation of your client and your coworkers? It's, it's one thing to be right. It's one thing to communicate being right at the right time in the right way. And it's going to vary from culture to culture to culture. Uh, and then also develop a strategic view. Really, the more you know about your client, client's priorities and their business, more than just, I'm an architect and I know how to design a building or an engineer and know how to design a taxiway, the better, the better service you're going to give to that client because you'll understand what their priorities are. And then finally, durability. Uh, and I, I said that you'll send sleepless nights just to come home after you adapt with local time zones. But in reality, whether you're working at home or working abroad, you're working across time zones and you'll find that your day becomes 24-7. Uh, we had a case where we were working on a, a project in Korea with consultants in, we were in California, consultants in Texas and Connecticut, Paris, um, probably somewhere else, I can't remember. So we had, we had people up at 1 in the morning, 4 in the afternoon, and, and uh, uh, 7 at night, and 8 in the morning. It was, it was all over the map. You have to be able, willing to and able to get up, be on the call, be intelligent, and then be available the next time around. So that's kind of the quick and dirty on what I think is important for young professionals to think about when it comes to international work. It's cool, it's sexy, but it has its own price to pay. Okay? I'll hand it back to you. I think that's my last slide. Thanks, Keith. I believe up next we have Finn Bonset. If we want to move to the next slide. Yep, he's uh, Atkins Sector Manager for Aviation Planning. Finn's been practicing professional in aviation master planning, aviation software development, and international training for planning professionals since 1999. Uh, his international project experience in the last five years includes projects and subject matter expertise in Egypt, Jordan, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Colombia, Brazil, Mexico, Taiwan, Vietnam, China, and Russia. He graduated from FIT in 1996 and then just had so much fun he went back and graduated again in 1999. And He's a FAA licensed pilot. So with that, I will turn it over to Finn for the next part of the webinar. Great. Thank you very much. How are you doing, Jeff? Okay. I'm assuming that's good. All right. Um, well, thank you very much for having me. I'm uh, really uh, looking forward to, to presenting my items here with, uh, with regards to international customs, traveling, et cetera, et cetera, and hope to add on to uh, a couple of things that, uh, that Keith mentioned as well. And uh, what I'd like to start out today is um, with, um, with regards to understanding language barriers and customs. I'd like to kind of go into that a little bit more in terms of what to do and what to look out for. You know, and uh, as Keith said, I think one of the most important things is absolutely how you would um, implement language skills. Even if you're not a linguist by nature, uh, learning a new language or just even saying a simple hello or inquiring about everyday items, it's going to put you ahead of the game. It's going to gain you respect. It's going to show that you've actually made an effort. Uh, and that, yeah, that goes a long, long way with a lot of clients and internationally, a lot of people. Um, you know, there's a couple of different ways, uh, and Keith mentioned a very good app. Um, I mean, I'm a big fan of Rosetta Stone. I understand it's an expensive item, but you can get it pretty cheap. Even the older versions are pretty good. You can get it pretty cheap on places like eBay and some other online items. Uh, it's also fun to do. I mean, it's visual learning. It's, it's pretty neat. Um, but guess what? It also makes you smarter. The more languages that you can try to speak or, you know, uh, have more of a world view, I think that's a win-win uh, either way. Uh, one of the things related to the language skills are, are your translations. And a lot of times, uh, with, with my experience having, having a lot of stuff in South America, um, sometimes you'll get a translated document from a non-aviation person. I've had that happen very, a lot of times. And what happens there is um, a lot of times some of the technical words that are out there with, you know, for different languages have a different meaning um, with regards to normal colloquial terms. Uh, so just make sure that you review this with a pro that may speak the language or that if you have a client contact that could review it from their side. I think that's very, very important. And any changes like that can be very costly. Uh, a quick example of that is I had a, a document, of, uh, it was a 300-page document, and they translated an uh, apron over you know, a platform for, for aircraft parking into Pardon in Spanish, or the Spanish one. And Pardon actually means a cooking apron. 
So that was that was mentioned at least five other times in the document that had to be a change. Uh, luckily somebody caught it, but it's the little things that, that, that make you look more professional if you if you could view it by an aviation person as well. So I, I couldn't have that more than that. Uh, local customs guys, very, very, very important. Uh, you know, even one offense could be enough to solve a deal. Uh, just one. So uh, you know, my 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 um, my, my idea is that, that you want to always learn as much as you can. Uh, get out of your comfort zone. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying you want to eat yak eyeballs, but that's what it takes sometimes. To, to, that that respect goes a long way. And uh, you know, a good example of that is, for example, if you travel to Japan and some, and some areas in China too, the way that you even accept a business card, you know, where you're giving someone a business card with making sure you get it with two hands, you look them in the eyes, you bow properly, and you accept a business card in the same way. Those things are important. So uh, little systems like, uh, for example, a key for showing. Uh, with, with local customs, read up on it. You can go to Google, you, you can Google anything uh, with, with, with regards to local customs, and that's really going to help you out. Uh, my fourth point here: plan, plan, plan. I'm, I'm a planner by nature, but you can plan uh, for, for for that client relationship. Uh, you want to learn more about the culture by sightseeing. I always make sure if I can, uh, company and time permitting, money permitting, I always try to plan an extra weekend. Get to know the country. Get to know the people. Um, and you know what I do sometimes is I'll, I'll invite someone that I've met from from a team, whether that's a younger person, uh, you know, young professionals like like to be with other young professionals. So invite them to go see the place, and, and, and most often you'll notice that they're the ones that show you around and you have a wonderful experience. And the next time you see them, you're friends and you have a better working relationship. So the next slide, please. Okay, um, again, going a little bit more in detail on some of the contracting and legal complexities. It's one of the topics that I personally have a lot of experience with. I, I ran my own company for five years doing international travel and international work, and I can also see it from, from that perspective. Um, but the most important thing I think to realize is that uh, you know, the way that the international business is conducted, there's a couple of different ways with contracting stakeholders. Uh, typically, it's a lot of government involvement, a lot of uh, public-private partnerships or free fees. Um, the systems typically have or uh, involve multiple banks in terms of funding. It's not where uh, we have FAA you know, funding here in the United States, like an equity improvement program or a giant trust fund. A lot of the money actually comes from the government through different types of, um, of factions and, and banks. So that makes it a high bureaucratic process. So, so, so those systems also take a lot longer. Uh, there's also a, a, a higher involvement from the DGAC. That's, that's your typical your FAA or your, your, your ruling agency in terms of aviation in the country. Um, and there's also various aviation factions, and they're not always the same. Uh, if, if you go to places like Brazil and you go to Colombia and some, some other places, um, a lot of the, the items such as airspace are, are, are run by the military, and sometimes it's very, very difficult to get through to them, um, especially in setting up meetings. And a lot of times the military won't talk to the general aviation folks, for example. So those are some of the barriers that you could expect, and uh, like anything else, we do have to deal with. Uh, tax issues, you know, I won't go into too much here, there's a lot of words here, but uh, you know, the main thing I want to talk about tax issues is a lot of times uh, when a foreign company hires a self-consultant or, or an expert, for example, a U.S. firm, um, they typically have to pay taxes on that because they've hired a foreign firm. So just make sure that if you, if you are looking at scoping and budgets, that that's included, and you want to talk to your potential clients, or you want to talk to your client about this. Um, you know, and that leads me to the next point here in that same sentence, I mean, watertight contracts that you think are watertight, uh, are almost you know are almost impossible. A lot of governments have to change. So if you have an unstable government, an unstable climate, um, contracts do change, and, and they could cancel a contract even if it's written somewhere where you can't. So these kind of things are very important. So also make sure make sure that the country that you're working in check the legal uh, the legal climate and go from there. Uh, currency issues. I'll be really quick on this one, but uh, this is an, an example I've had when we were doing Atkins, um, where a lot of times companies will try to have a set currency indicator, for example, with the Colombian peso. Well, they'll set it at a certain rate just to guarantee that they're going to get paid uh, either a higher rate for the, um, the currency exchange, and that may affect you if all of a sudden the currency goes up and down. Either you're making money or you lose a lot more money. So you have to be sure that in the contract that you agree upon a good rate uh, or some sort of um, political, political excuse me, um, some type of system where it is more flexible. So next slide, please. All right, now don't laugh too much with the two cats in the toilet there, but uh, you'll get where I'm going here. This first part here, payment issues. And I have this view from having my own company for that, for that time. Um, and believe it or not, sometimes to even get payment approval or the payment itself, it takes time. 
it works a lot different than what we used to do. There's a lot of assurances in the United States for payments and for contracts. Again, um, based on my experience in, in, in places like Brazil, Colombia, Egypt, um, a lot of times you have to go over there and talk to a couple of different people to get the ball rolling, uh, to get that contract you know, to con get that contract paid. Um, so what's important, and this is, I, I can't tell enough, if you're a young professional and you're on that side of the spectrum with, with finances and payments, it's always important to maintain constant communication with a financial person on the other side. Uh, you know, to the extent where it could be bothersome to do that, uh, but that does ensure quicker payments and contract applicability. Uh, and just realize in many countries that this is the norm. It's a different, it's a different way of uh, cultural norms. Second point there, law of the lands. Uh, courts of law differ significantly in foreign countries. Um, it's kind of a no-brainer, but uh, you know, the, the best way to handle it, and what, what I've seen a lot in business, is you know, hire a local law firm uh, or, or lawyers that understand the system. Uh, it's very difficult, especially if there's a language barrier in, in, in trying to get contracts signed and trying to get payments, like I said before. Um, a lot of companies that, that, that are investing different, in different countries, uh, such as Brazil, uh, they'll try to have an office in country if they can, or use a local company as a client to go after projects. And that makes it a little bit easier on the law side. Uh, again, government international contracting is quite, uh, quite procedural. Uh, FCPA, Keith mentioned already, but I can't, I can't mention it either. either. Uh, FCPA always adhere to the uh, Foreign Corrupt Policy Act. Um, you know, Big Brother is certainly watching now with a lot more uh, spying and things coming out of that nature. Um, there are more recent crackdowns on offshore banking. There are clients that try to do this. I've, I've seen it. Uh, I didn't participate in that, of course, but I've seen a lot of different directions for trying to not pay taxes in terms of hiring a, a, um, a foreign business or an American business. They will try. So just be absolutely sure you know that FCPA um, and go with it, flow with it. Uh, next slide. Okay, now this one's a little wordy, so I'll 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 it kind of down a bit here. But um, basically, this one is uh, FAA, ICAO, EASA for you know, local regulations. We know what to look for. Uh, and again, I just wanted to highlight on this because I've had a lot of issues here uh, with some of my experience internationally. Um, as as you may know, ICAO is the uh, is the body for most uh, aviation type recommended practices and standards throughout the world. And what happens is basically countries adopt these standards, but they also tweak them. And if you compare, compare it with FAA um, regs and advisory circulars, it's quite similar, but there's a lot of differences. Remember, they're in meters and they're in feet. Now, those, there are differences there. And a lot of the ICAO annexes, like Annex 14 on the airport planning design side, um, they, they have a lot of older ways. A lot of these ways were, were invented in the 1970s. But if you look at FAA, for example, with the new taxiway design, a lot of differences there. So just, just be aware of that. Um, always ask, that first bullet point, super important, always ask for a country's own regulations, um, aviation and related. Uh, get them translated if you don't speak the language. Just, there are a lot of differences. Uh, if you look at a place like Colombia, they've adopted IKEA, but they've made changes. Uh, my biggest example there, uh, real quick, um, I, I worked on an airside design project for a cargo project. And I asked for the IKEO uh, regulations. I, asked the, I, I basically asked the board directors if this was correct. And it was, and uh, at the end of my preliminary design, we had a board meeting with the Aeronautical Seville, which is kind of the, um, their, their FAA. Um, and the guy came in with a legal document, and it said, uh, basically in 1972, they had one small change, and the change stuck, and they had a different approach surface percentage, and uh, I had to change everything around. And nobody showed this to me. I had asked the board of directors, but I never asked the, you know, their local FAA for it, so I didn't double check. So guys, I can't tell you enough, double check, get your regs, get your specs, uh, make sure you can go back. Uh, a lot of times things that were created in 1970 in a place like Brazil, it's still current. So I, I can't stress that enough. That was a big lesson learned for me. Um, so that was basically my second bullet point there. My third one here, um, the regulations are not necessarily loose. You know, a lot of people think you know, when you do look at regulations in different countries that you can go around things. Um, there's, there's a certain element of truth for that in terms of technical um, technical loopholes, um, but please know that the FA is well respected abroad. I've used a lot of FA methodologies in, in place of ICAO and local regulations with approval. Uh, a lot of the methodologies for the, for the FA are a lot more current than, than their own. And once they see this, once they see that, that you've got good methodologies, they make sound sense, that they're logical, they will adapt. Um, you know, use agencies such as IATA, International Air Transport Association, and, and the Air Traffic Association for uh, Air Transport Association, excuse me, for further reference in the national regulations. There's a lot of good recommended practice and standards that are applicable to international airports. 
Um, and uh, if you haven't heard of the Airport Development Reference Manual from IATA, go get it. It's a, it's a very good document. It's respected internationally, and it's something I can really recommend. Uh, I do think you have to pay for it, but it's worth it's, it's, it's way to go. Um, and the last one is what I've already talked about a little bit here, but um, you know, I've, I've actually used the new advisory circular in, in international projects uh, to, save, to save costs on failed design, uh, even when it was preliminary, and that, that's helped my clients out a lot. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm getting close to the end here. I don't want to take too much more time. I know that we have more speakers. Um, but real quick here, um, one of the things uh, I want to highlight, and I'm going to leave you with that, is that a lot of times when, when you're going internationally, um, you tend to work with people that are not as experienced as you are in aviation uh, or have the, the world experience based on projects that you've worked on. So a lot of times you are the educator. Uh, you are the person that they're going to rely on. And a lot of times they want to know. They, 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 they will ask questions. They want to implement it. They want to learn. And you'll notice that especially in places in South America. Everybody wants to learn. Now, the biggest part of that is that that's a fine balance. And if you look at my second bullet point there, be aware of the amount of training you provide and your company's future involvement. You know, you can absolutely train people, but the issue that, that happens there quite frequently is they will take that knowledge and throw you out of the project. That ha that's happened quite a lot in the South. Um, so you have to be careful with it. It's a fine balance. Uh, you, don't, you don't want to train your way out of a project that they can do everything that you can do. Um, and it sounds weird to say that, but it's the absolute truth. I mean, it's great to have uh, sharing. It's great to teach to get everybody up to speed in different countries. However, again, we're consultants, we're aviation planners, we're, we're, we're businesses. So we have to understand um, that it's important to find that balance between giving away too much information as well. You want to remain the expert. So having said that, um, you know, got a little picture of me on the right here. The one, you know, one, one thing I can say is, guys, enjoy the travel. It's something great to do as a young professional. It's a great experience. Have an open mind, and uh, I'll leave it with that. So um, thank you for your time, and I'll go to the next presenter. Thanks, man. Uh, finally, we have Steve Pella. He's the vice president with RSNH, works out of Jacksonville, Florida. He leads the company in global strategic development for the company's five practices of aviation, transportation infrastructure, corporate architecture, construction management, and aerospace and defense. Steve's been an ACC member for over 20 years, and he's also been active with the Young Professionals, the Design Symposium, and security committees while also serving one term on the ACC Board of Directors. So with that, I will turn it over to Steve. Good afternoon. I'd first like to say uh, to those who have been in my young professional groups at the symposium, I noticed that some of you are on this call and I appreciate the support. I hope I live up to your standards. And to those from RSMH who joined, uh, I appreciate you standing in as well and look forward to some good dialogue and conversation at the end of my comments. Slightly different tack from my colleagues is as a young professional, uh, you, there's a lot of curiosity, there's a lot of thoughts, so I thought I'd spend my time dealing with some of those quick questions that you have that's not necessarily business minded, it's more curiosity of hey, what's this gig? Am I right for it? Uh, what is the mental challenge of doing international? It looks sexy, but I could use the frequent flyer miles. And I've always been curious about international work. So I wanted to, to throw some things out to you. How do you know if, if it's right for you? And I think the first part would be, are you naturally curious? Do you want to see how things work? Do you want to see how people tick? Do you want to see how economies grow? And if you have a natural curiosity to life, well, then I'd go to the next door. If you're willing to face challenges where sometimes you're in international waters and there's not a thing you can do about something until 24 hours later or until your office wakes up on the next morning, uh, are you okay with that? And it could be uh, a carrier goes bankrupt and you can't get from one location to another. It could be that your visas are not in uh, alignment and you just have to sit. And it could be sitting at a bus station, train station, at an airport, or 
perhaps you might have an office or a hotel, but how do you how do you face adversity? Language. It is much easier today than it was 15 or 20 years ago. You can get your iPhone, you can dial in some languages that are about 70% correct. You can talk to a cab driver. You can, uh, I wouldn't necessarily talk to your clients this way, but you can get around much easier. And so that makes it much more acceptable. However, as some of my colleagues have said, language is important. And I think one of the big pieces on language is it's a courtesy. If you don't make the effort to at least learn or at least attempt to learn something, you're one of those ignorant Americans. And uh, if you've ever been on holiday around the world, you can see those ignorant Americans and they expect the world to cater to them. And that's part of the reason why the world doesn't like Americans that much these days. So I, uh, I invite you to be curious and I invite you to be, uh, I invite you to be classy about it. Show some respect to, to the foreign lands and think about a little bit of language. I thought Finn did a nice job of talking about that. Time zones. We're not just talking East Coast, West Coast. Uh, I laugh at ACC meetings when somebody says, well, I've got jet lag. I just flew in from the West Coast or I just flew in from the East Coast. Uh, I'm going to Dubai tomorrow afternoon. Uh, that's eight or nine hours. That's 14 hours in, in a tube. And you know what? Meetings happen still in the U.S. that I get to make all during the night and then I get to work all day in Dubai and Abu Dhabi. So think about what type of time zones might be your limit. What about family and loved ones? When somebody says, hey, I'd like for you to go work a project, we're not talking a weekend. We're not talking a week. It could be a two or three week assignment. It could be here's six months. Uh, Dave Stater, some of you know him from CH2M Hill, and he got the uh, grandiose two to three year uh, assignment in Dubai. Move the wife, move the kids. Say goodbye to your parents for a while. Say goodbye to Little League Baseball for a while. Uh, What's, what's your cost? What's your risk? Uh, again, that adversity piece, what are you willing to do? And if you're single or you have a, a partner and that's it, guess what? I would take advantage of it if it's offered. Are you professionally proficient? And Finn mentioned a little bit of this. Know where you are in your career because you will be teaching. A lot of the world, especially when you go to Asia, looks to use your proficiency for about 30% of the work and then because you're high cost labor they will look to use lower cost labor for the rest of the work. So know your proficiency and your cost. Is there a chance to step up in your career? Hopefully it is by doing something but if it's just a two-week assignment that's not stepping up in your career. Your company is looking for young professionals, and at rs &H, we're looking for them every single day to say, yes, I'm willing to go and serve. I'm willing to go and do some of that time overseas, uh, not just parachute in and parachute out. Clients know when you parachute in and parachute out that you're really not dedicated to them. Are you willing to go through, actually I should ask, when's the longest you have been gone? And how did that feel? So again, if you're naturally curious and you're risk adverse and you're willing to travel, great. And is the company supportive of, this, of your initiatives? Have they worked these things out HR-wise? Have they worked these things out with your career planning? Does it look like a good fit? Next slide, please. Whoop, I'm sorry, if you can back up. One more. There we go, relationships. You know, we hear a lot in the U.S. that relationships matter, and they do. And if you're in aviation, most of the time it's still with a government entity, but relationships still matter. It's the same in foreign lands. A friend is a friend, regardless of where you're at. However, if you're just a friend when you're there and not through time zones, you're really not being that friend. Uh, have you ever had a Skype beer with somebody before? And it could be breakfast for you, but it's beer time for them and have a beer with them. People do do business with relationships. 
and please realize that some cultures just don't warm as fast to a, a new friendship as Westerners do, especially Americans. Don't be that ignorant American and realize that some cultures don't share as Americans do. We happen, Americans usually wear everything on their face and they're very upfront. You'll find most of the rest of the world is a little more guarded. Consider using Link and Skype and other uh, tools to assist in trying to be closer when you're not. Next slide, please. That timing thing. It's been mentioned by Keith and, and by Finn. But if you have one project and it's just a one time zone, well, that's OK. Is it a project? Is it a client? Do you have multiple international clients on multiple clients and multiple continents? And before you say yes, uh, I know that Finn and Keith and I all deal with some of these situations. But I can have dinner with my family on the east coast of the US and then I go back into my home office and I'm on the phone from 9 p.m. until midnight dealing with Asia. I'll get a five hour sleep. I'll wake up and call the Middle East from 5 a.m. to 6 a.m. Might work out or take the kids to school. Then I will call Europe. Then I will go through a, a few things that I need to get done myself in my own office. And then I start thinking about South America because they're a few hours ahead of us. And then, oh, by the way, there's your domestic job as well. And when you start thinking about that around the clock, and it's not just one day, but now you're thinking, well, the Middle East operates Sunday through Thursday, and what about the rest of the world? And all of a sudden, you have one real true day off, which might be Saturday. So think about those things as far as, as you go forward. Next slide, please. I was asked to list some organizations. If you're a young professional who's just thinking about doing some work yourself for your firm, or you are granted the license to say, where should we go, and what should we do, and who should we contact, I offer these organizations to you. They're good to start with. Their money, first and foremost, is usually all protected and paid in the US. For instance, if you do business in Africa, one of the first questions is, where is the money today? If you're working for one of these organizations, you know that it's already in a Western bank. These organizations usually end up doing more planning, education, or environmental type work, uh, with the exception of maybe a Millennium Challenge Corporation and World Bank. Uh, and again, some of the things are just starter pieces. ICAO will get into a little bit more depth depending on the country, but they can guarantee you that the money is in their bank uh, before they ever offer uh, the work to the consulting community. So be, uh, be curious, look at those websites and see if some of those uh, are good for you. In some cases, it's a one-up project. You parachute in, you do the work, and it can be a great entry into a very rich relationship with future clients. Next slide, please. Here's some fun ones. Realize that international is a business. You're trying to grow your company. You're trying to grow the profits. You're trying to grow the return on investment that your investors, your owners, have put forward. So when you go abroad, who is your competition? And it might be other US firms, but the reality is it's usually Western firms. Europe is really our competitor. There's a lot of great Western uh, European consulting firms, as is the, in the US. And you will find them in South America, you will find them in Africa, and you will find them in Asia. Understand who your competition is and how good they can be. You, as an American, are a high-cost labor in most countries. So as you think about putting together a team, how are you going to offset the cost of your team because you're on it? Uh, it's not, uh, I mentioned a little bit earlier, in some countries you can have up to 30% maybe as Western expertise, and they will finish off through a design institute 
the other 70% of the work, or perhaps you might have Western labor lead a team and you can hire local engineers or architects or planners to offset, offset your cost and work uh, under your direction. Understand your role in reporting. You still work for your current firm, although your client is the client and you might be in a joint venture or some other uh, type of arrangement to which you need to understand who do I call first when something hits the fan. You will be frustrated and at some point you will be embarrassed. Something just really simple happens in a foreign country and you'll just smile. And that's all you have, that's all you can do is smile. Keith, Finn and I, have, we could tell war stories of times we've been embarrassed or frustrated in foreign lands and after a, after a night or two later they're all really funny. But please realize it's going to happen. Uh, the assignment overseas does not necessarily mean that you're a mercenary and it's really big dollars. It could be. I've, I've seen some folks who have not been back to the U.S. who are Americans and they haven't been back to the U.S. in 10 years and they go from large infrastructure to large infrastructure project and they love it. So be reasonable. What's the appropriate thing? Do you have kids to be schooled? What about uh, your partner and, and uh, their work? living arrangements, transportation, transportation arrangements, be sensitive to all those things. You will make lifelong associations, they're awesome. I just got off the phone with somebody this morning in the Middle East and I'd never spoken with them before, never heard of their company and oddly enough we had three friends in common within the aviation industry. You'll find these are very rewarding and it is my hope that some of you are inspired by the three comments, the three speakers today, and that you yourself will be presenting this sometime in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Steve. <clears throat> yep. I, uh, with that, uh, we conclude our um, webinar specific content. I uh, just wanted to go over YP activities before we jump into the questions. Um, if everybody who called into this call is not on our ACC contact email list, uh, we will have contact info available at the end of this webinar. So please just send us an email and we'll get you on the contact list. That'll make sure you're up to date on YP webinars, our conference calls, which also include the surveys that we send out to our membership to chart the way forward. Um, and we'll also keep you up to date on the YP Innovation Competition. I, I just, not to hijack the webinar, but just for one minute, I wanted to highlight the Innovation Competition. Um, project abstracts are due on July 10th, 2015. Those project abstracts, this competition focuses on industry innovation. Uh, it can be technical or operational, and it is essentially a, if everybody has seen Shark Tank, I think this is the best way to describe it, it's a Shark Tank pitch on what a new or innovative idea in the aviation industry could be. So a something that could be a presentation or there's many different media formats, there's plenty of information available online, but we encourage everybody on this call to please form teams. You only need two members for two ACC members on your team to qualify. So if, for all of our uh, people on the call who do work maybe not for an ACC member firm or they work for an aviation authority, I encourage everyone to reach out and to get a part of the team and to, subscript, to submit an abstract on July 10th. Um, final submissions are due on September 28th, 2015. Uh, prizes, first place prize, you are uh, open for a presentation at the ACC Design Symposium and every team member also wins $500. So that's all sponsored by the Arnold W. Thompson Charitable Trust. And then finally, uh, please look into attending the ACC Airport Technical Workshops that are held this July 16th and 17th. So with that, I think we can... Yeah, Zach, real quick before we jump down, I also wanted to take an opportunity to remind everyone of the ACC committees. You should have them all there in front of you. Um, along with participating in the ACC YP Forum, a great way to get directly involved in ACC 
and the industry in general is by participating on the ACC committees. Um, you can see we cover a broad spectrum of topics. The extent of your participation in the committees is up to you. However, please keep in mind that participation is ACC member exclusive. Uh, the committees will have periodic conference calls to dis discuss technical topics and uh, also offer a number of in-person meetings every year. So uh, if you have any interest in that, you'll see uh, a question in the final survey that we send around. Please let us know. We'd love to get you signed up. With that, let's get to a couple of questions. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes left. And I think our first one uh, will go to all our speakers. And I think we might have lost Keith um, uh, to uh, an airplane. Oh, he's still there. Great. Well, this one will go to all of you. And maybe we'll start with Keith. Um, what do you see as the next large emerging market for aviation? The next large, well, one of the things that I've found most fascinating is the impact of the new 787 and you know, sort of the, the new ultra long haul twin aisle uh, wide body and I think it's going to break open markets you know sort of the uh, the long thin markets uh, Austin to London San Diego to Narita San Jose to Narita uh, to me that's the most fascinating part of what's happening in aviation is the the growth in international traffic outside of the traditional gateway hubs uh, I, it, Partly because I think the airplane's cool, but partly because I think it's just something that the time has come. Great. Uh, think, of course, that I'm not talking about the uh, aircraft I'm supposed to be on that has a, a hydraulic leak, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Finn or Steve, do you guys have anything to add? Sure. Um, this has been, uh, you know, I, I think if, if you look at, at the overall emerging market, and it's been emerging for a while now, I still think China's at the hub there. And they're going to be building over 100 airports, they're in the process of many larger ones, but they're also going to be building a lot of regional airports. Uh, and if you look at the investment in aviation in China, it's unbelievable. I mean, they're, they're coming out with their own air aircraft design company, uh, I believe it's the C-99 that's going to come out. So it's very similar to a regional jet that we know, the CRJ, the DRJs. And uh, there's, there's already a thousand of those on order, so they need airports to fly to. So if, if you ask me, that would be the most emerging market, I think, I have nothing further to add, thanks. Fantastic. Um, so maybe this one will start with Steve. As other countries continue to develop, do you see the role of U.S.-based companies doing professional services work in other countries growing or shrinking over the next 10 years? Well, that's a fun one. I like to debate. Uh, I think it's going to grow, and quite frankly, our Western European friends are scared to death that the Americans at some point are going to get really active and start really working around the world. So I think it's nothing but uh, on the upside. And Finn or Keith, anything to add? The question was on professionals working around the world? Uh, U.S.-based companies doing professional services work. Uh, you know, are U.S.-based uh, uh, companies going to see more work or less work over the next 10 years? You know, I, it, it's interesting because when things kind of went soft in the U.S., everybody turned their focus internationally. There's a lot of stuff starting to happen again in the U.S., so I'm hoping that we don't turn our backs on, on being a part of a larger global network. I think we'll, we'll play a larger role, but that's not to say that everybody's not going to play an increasing role. The, the challenge, I think, is some of the emerging markets are going to develop their own expertise and won't necessarily need Western input as much as they have in the past, so that's going to be the interesting balance. It's not so much us versus the Europeans, but Western versus the growth of you know, the homegrown you know, Chinese and Southeast Asian capabilities. Great, Finn. Anything to add? No, I, I agree with I, uh, I agree with Keith on that one, and um, I think one of the important things to factor in there is a lot of times, you know, larger U.S. companies um, are, are a lot more expensive than, uh, as actually Steve Steve mentioned, some of the European companies that are that are very much competing and very competitive in price just because they can uh, with a lot of government subsidies funding some of those companies. So it, it's a price point. And um, yeah, but in the next 10 years, I do see that there would be more development from the American side. Um, you know, as long as that, becomes, as that, that pricing process becomes more streamlined all around. Yeah, let me, let me modify my comment a little bit because, you know, as a, as a global firm, it, you know, I'm thinking of this as a guy in the U.S. That, exports work to other countries, but we're increasingly finding ourselves placing people in other offices in other regions that do work within that region. So 
it, it's one thing to say we're going to have some homegrown capabilities within other parts of the world and the emerging markets in particular, but that's not to say that they're not a part of our company at the same time. Great. Um, and I think one last one here before we'll, we'll wrap up, and uh, this kind of gets back to the war stories, I guess, but what, ha uh, and we'll start with Finn this time, what has been your greatest challenge in pursuing or managing a project overseas? Well, that's a, that's a pretty open-ended question, but um, yeah, I, I think the biggest challenge, and, and again, I'm looking at it from, from when I have my own business and also what I'm doing currently, uh, the biggest challenge really has been getting to understand the process. The learning, the, the learning curve could be quite, uh, quite slow uh, because there's so many different things involved, and it's different country per country. So, um, yeah, the difficult part is learning. It, it takes some time. Uh, just, you know, I think Steve said that as well. I mean, two weeks is not going to cut it. You know, international, starting an international career to me is really, you do this for three to five years and then you have the real expertise to understand how different countries work. And you kind of come up with a boilerplate system that really works in most places. So, you know, that's the challenge. That's, that's I think, the hardest part is getting to know those systems and processes of that. Steve? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Oh. Uh, what has been your greatest challenge in pursuing or managing a project overseas? That I didn't bite the bullet and say what I said earlier and actually live over there and I'm the one who's parachuting. It frustrates me to no end. Uh, Keith? Yeah, I think language skills tend to be the biggest impediment to fully understanding what your client wants and being a part of the, the process and developing those relationships. If you've got, you know, particularly in Asia, there are some languages that you're just not going to learn from Rosetta Stone overnight. You might be able to catch a cab, but you're never going to have a meaningful conversation on a deep technical issue. And by not having that capability, you're relying on others to do, and that's not a strong way to develop long-term relationships. Great. And with that, I think uh, we will wrap up. Uh couple of things real quick. Uh, Zach had mentioned our airport technicals workshop um, July 16th and 17th in uh, Washington, D.C. For all those who haven't participated in this event before, this is the premier event for networking with FAA uh, officials on the latest and greatest in federal guidance and policy. We have a number of webinars coming up as well. Uh, the ACC annual conference is scheduled for November 9th to the 11th in Newport Beach, California. And finally, on the same topic, we are working on uh, finalizing the dates for the 2015 ACC Global Business Summit, which we're tentatively looking at in December in the United Kingdom. So more to come on that. Finally, be December 1, 2, or 3, by the way. Oh, December 1, 2, or 3. And uh, Keith has been working closely with uh, some of our uh, colleagues in the UK on that as well. So uh, we're looking forward to that event. Um, a day and a half, probably spanning one of those, two of those three days. Fantastic. Uh, with that, we'd like to thank Keith, Finn, Steve, Zach, and Carly for helping with today's webinar. Uh, before we end, uh, Zach or any of our final uh, our, our speakers have anything to add? Just, I, I would just for, add another plug because it wasn't in that upcoming event for the innovation competition. And Fantastic. thanks for calling in. Yep, that too. And this, this is Finn Boss. I just want to thank everybody for the participation, including me on this. Uh, it was really fun. and. Uh, if anybody has any questions about the uh, email, say here, shoot me an email. Uh, I like to uh, I like to work with them professionally in terms of understanding things. So, you know, thank you again for having me. Yeah, if I didn't hear that correctly, if you have additional questions and you send them to Zach, Zach, are you going to file those and allow us to answer them in a different form? Yeah, we're we're happy to do that. Um, so we can we can send that out, and everybody also will receive a survey link. So um, there will be a survey and feedback for this webinar so we will also provide a response to that survey so we can go ahead and send that out at that time as well. Does that work Chris and Matt? That works. Uh, the survey and the presentation will come out to everyone who's registered in the next half hour. And with that we will close out. Thank you for your time today and we look forward to uh, working with you uh, in the future. Have a great day. Thanks guys.